In this next reading, we will cover simple linear regression. So let's start with the basics. Financial analysts often try to explain one variable by using another variable. So for example, assume that these are the capital expenditures for five companies, and these are the return on assets for those same companies. A financial analyst believes that COPEX can be used to explain the value for the return on assets. So this makes COPEX the independent variable, or X value, and the return on assets the dependent variable, or Y value. We can actually plot the relationship between X and Y in a scatter plot. The first company would be plotted here, then the second company, and so on. But what does this have to do with linear regression? Well, there appears to be a positive relationship between X and Y, and we can actually estimate this linear relationship with a line of best fit. The process of coming up with this line is called linear regression. And to be more specific, it's a simple linear regression because we only have one independent variable. Let's look at this line more in detail. First of all, you should know the equation for a linear regression. If you remember the basic equation for a line, the expected value of y is equal to b hat naught plus b hat 1 times x plus an error term. So let's break down the equation. This term is the y-intercept, which is the value of y when x is 0. And this term is the slope of the line, which is the change in the y variable over the change in the x variable. Here is the actual equation for the line in this example. So according to this regression, if we plug in x equals 7, and then we solve for y, the estimated value of y, according to the regression line, is 13.2. So let's confirm with the scatter plot. When x equals 7, the estimated value of y, according to the regression line, is 13.2. But wait a second. If we look at the original data, the actual value of y, when x equals 7, should be equal to 10. So for every value of x, there is an estimated value of y, which falls on the regression line, and there is an actual value for y, which might fall above the line or below the line. The reason for this is that the regression line is not perfect, it's just an estimate. The difference between each estimated and actual value is called a residual. And the way to account for these differences between the estimated y values and the actual y values is by adding an error term to the equation for a linear regression. There is one last thing you must remember, called the least squares criterion. In a simple linear regression, the goal is to create a line that minimizes the square deviations from the line. In other words, the objective is to minimize the residuals. In order for a linear regression to work, there are four assumptions that must be met. The first assumption is linearity, which states that the relationship between the dependent and the independent variables must be linear. If it's not linear, like in this example, then a linear model will not work. For this assumption, you should remember that x values should not be random. However, the residuals should be random meaning that some values will randomly fall above the regression line and others will randomly fall below it. The second assumption is homoskedasticity, which states that the variance of the residuals should be constant across all observations. If you look at this graph, the variance of the residuals is constant throughout the entire range of x values. In this other example, however, the variation is smaller at first and then it increases which is a violation of the second assumption. The third assumption is independence, which states that the pair of x's and y's must be independent of one another. This also means that there is no correlation between the residuals. In other words, just because you know the first residual, that doesn't mean you can predict what the remaining residuals will look like. An example of a violation of this assumption would look like this, because we can clearly see a predictable pattern in the residuals. The fourth assumption is normality, which states that the residuals must be normally distributed. So, if you could take the values of the residuals and plot them on a distribution, it would be a normal distribution. 
Now, let's look at the components of variance. The total variation is equal to the explained variation plus the unexplained variation. We can actually calculate each of these components. The total variation is known as the sum of squares total. Explained variation is the sum of squares regression. And the unexplained variation is the sum of squares error. These are their formulas, but it's much easier to visualize the equation for each one. So let's use the regression line we were looking at earlier to visualize each equation. To calculate the sum of squares total, the first thing you need to do is identify the actual y values. Then, you need to calculate the average of the y values. So in this example, the average y value is 12.6. Next, you need to calculate the differences between each y value and the average. If you square each of these differences and add them together, that's how you calculate the sum of squares total. The sum of squares regression is slightly different because it is based on the y values that are estimated by the regression line and the average y value. It focuses on the differences between the estimated y values, which are found on the regression line and the average. And don't forget that you must square each difference and add them together to find the sum of squares regression. And lastly, we have the sum of squares error, which focuses on the residuals. In case you don't remember, the residuals are the difference between the actual and the estimated y values. Notice how the explained variation is based on the y values that can be explained by the regression line, while the unexplained variation comes from the error terms. The reason why these three components are so important is because they can be used to measure goodness of fit, which basically tells you how well the regression line fits the data. There are two common ways to measure a regression line's goodness of fit, the coefficient of determination and the F statistic. The coefficient of determination, also known as R squared, ranges from zero to one, and it measures how much of the dependent variable's variation is explained by the independent variable. It is calculated as the explained variation divided by the total variation which we have seen is the same as the sum of squares regression, divided by the sum of squares total. The higher the R squared, the better the model. For example, a value of 90% means that 90% of the variation can be explained by the regression line. So the line is pretty accurate. You should also note that if you take the square root of R squared, you get the correlation between X and Y. The F statistic tests whether the slopes in a regression are equal to zero. In order to calculate this test statistic, you need to use the following formula. The sum of squares regression divided by k is known as MSR or the mean square regression. The denominator is also known as MSE or the mean square error. And remember that the higher the F statistic, the better. In practice, all of these measures are summarized in what's called the ANOVA table. The ANOVA table organizes the sources of variance into a single table. Here is what the table looks like. It gives you the sum of squares regression, which is the same as the explained variation, the sum of squares error, which is the unexplained variation, and the sum of squares total, which is the total variation. The table will also give the degrees of freedom for each measure. You are then given the MSR, the MSE, and the F statistic. You should know that for simple linear regressions, K equals 1 because there's only one independent variable. So let's plug in 1 instead of K to simplify the formulas. There is one last formula you should know for this reading. The standard error of the estimate is simply equal to the square root of the mean square error. The lower the standard error, the better the model. So the next time you see an ANOVA table, you should know what each of its values represent. For example, looking at this ANOVA table to calculate the R squared, you would use these two values to get 92%. This next learning outcome covers hypothesis tests for linear regression. Make sure you have completed the reading on hypothesis testing because we will be building upon the concepts that were covered in that reading. The first type of hypothesis test we'll review is testing the slope coefficient. 
Whenever you have a linear regression, you can perform a hypothesis test to test the significance of the slope coefficient. Using a hypothesis test, you can ask yourself, is the slope statistically different from a given value? Is it greater than a given value? Or is it less than a given value? Let's go through an actual example of how to test this. In this example, here is the linear regression we will be testing, and these values are given. Assume that you want to test whether the slope is statistically different from a value of 1. Step 1 is to state the hypothesis. Let's draw the graph to visualize that it will be a two-tailed test. Next, we need to find the critical values and the test statistic. To find the critical value, you will need to use the t-table, which we have covered in past readings. Using a t-table, a two-tailed test with four degrees of freedom and a 5% level of significance has these critical values. So let's label them on the graph. Next, we need to calculate the test statistic. Here is the formula. It is equal to the slope coefficient of the linear regression minus the hypothesized value, which you can find in the hypothesis. Don't forget to divide by the standard error of the slope coefficient. The standard error will usually be given, but you can memorize the formula if you have extra time. So plug in the appropriate values and your test statistic should be equal to 0.94. Let's label it on the graph. Remember that the tails represent the rejection area, but since the test statistic does not fall in the rejection area, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So, in conclusion, the null hypothesis is correct, meaning that the slope coefficient is not statistically different from 1. Here is the cheat sheet that summarizes the steps we just covered for a slope test. In the same way that we can conduct a hypothesis test on the slope, we can use the same process to test the y-intercept in a linear regression. So you can actually test whether the y-intercept is statistically different from, less than, or greater than some value. The critical values are found using the t-table, and this is the formula for the test statistic. The first value is the y-intercept of the linear regression. The next value is the value found in your hypothesis, and the denominator is the standard error of the intercept, which will usually be given. The curriculum also covers a hypothesis test for correlation, which is used to test the correlation between two variables. For this type of test, this is what the alternative hypothesis looks like. The critical values are found using a t-table, and this is the formula for the test statistic, which is based on the correlation coefficient between x and y. For this next section, let's assume that you are given the following linear regression. You are given a value for x, and you are asked to predict y. By plugging in x into the equation, we get the estimated value of y according to the regression line. So let's plot the estimated value of y on the regression line. But as we have seen before, the regression line is not perfect, so the actual value of y will fall somewhere above or below the estimated value. So how would you calculate this interval? To calculate the interval, you need to use this formula. It is simply the estimated value of y plus and minus a critical value times the standard error of the forecast. You can find the critical value on the t-table by assuming that it is a two-tailed test. Don't forget that the degrees of freedom are n minus 2. The standard error of the forecast may be given, but when it's not, here is the formula to calculate it. It is a function of the standard error of the estimate, the variance of the x values, the mean of the x values, and the number of observations. Let's wrap up this reading by discussing functional forms. As we have seen throughout this reading, when the relationship between x and y is linear, you can use linear regression to explain the relationship. However, if the relationship is nonlinear, you can actually modify either the dependent or independent variables so that a linear regression model is effective. There are three ways to modify the data, so let's go over them. In a log-lin model, the dependent variable is logarithmic and the independent variable is linear. So you basically take the natural log of the y values. In a lin-log model, 
the dependent variable is linear, and the independent variable is logarithmic. So you basically take the natural log of the x values. And in a log-log model, both the dependent and independent variables are logarithmic. So you take the natural log of both the x and y values. But how do you know which of these modifications is the best option? After modifying the data and running the regression, remember that the best models are the ones that have a higher r-squared value, a high f statistic, and a low standard error of the estimate. Other signs that indicate a good model are that the residuals are uncorrelated and have a normal distribution. This is the end of the reading. Well done. For more videos like these, go to wallstreetnotes.com and master the entire CFA curriculum by watching simple animated videos.